Hello, and welcome to this last uh, session at DevOps. Well, there is still the movie after that, so uh, we still get to share something nice. Um, so, I was here last year, and uh, I spoke about TensorFlow. Uh, I want to do uh, some more of that today. Um, and uh, the video was recorded. There were a couple more of these videos out, and uh, uh, the spooky metric is that people have, have spent 100,000 hours watching those videos. Um, thanks for the attention, but no thanks for the pressure. Um, but this means that a lot and a lot and a lot of people are learning uh, machine learning and TensorFlow, and those are not people in labs. Those are people like, like you and me, normal developers, who need these technologies because they solve real problems that uh, even five years ago we had no idea how to solve. So I, I find myself in a, in a nice position as, as a software developer where I, I still spend a lot of time on GitHub, but I spend, I spend even more time on ArcSieve now, uh, having fun with stuff like that. And although uh, I find this highly entertaining, um, I do not have the time to uh, look up everything that they say in these papers because, you know, I, I could look up what a kullback leibner divergence is, I could look up what a Borel set is, but in these equations they don't even define all the operators they use. Because, yeah, obviously, either you know or you have no business reading this paper. Um, so, this doesn't help ship projects. And on the other end of the, of the spectrum, you will have people who tell you, oh, that's all easy. Deep learning, just that. So it looks easier, and, and maybe we will try to do something more along those lines. The reality is that uh, deep learning today is, uh, is, is maturing from the labs into the real world of software engineering. It's a new field of computer science. Lots of people are, are learning it, not as a field of mathematics, but as a field of computer engineering. And uh, even though a lot of the research is, is really very high-end out there, a lot of it is trickling down um, and, and, and is being packaged up into, uh, into ready-to-use tools uh, like, for instance, TensorFlow. And so that's what I would like to do with you today. I would like to, to build a neural network together that uses some of those reusable blocks uh, so that you can see uh, how these architectures work and how us computer engineers can piece this together and, and actually solve a problem. So I like plain spotting, so I decided, to, I decided to build a neural network that can spot airplanes in aerial imagery. First, a trip to Kaggle. Who knows Kaggle? Yeah, shout out for Kaggle. Kaggle is, uh, is an online community of data scientists where they share data sets and all, they, they also share uh, their approaches to those data sets. So when I was in search of a data set, I directly headed to Kaggle and I found this data set which has little 20 by 20 tiles with airplanes and I can start classifying them into plane or not plane. That is not quite the plane detector I want, but it's a good first step. So let's build this first neural network uh, this one, for those who have seen the session for, from last year, is extremely similar. We are in known territory. We will do this by the book. So every decision, just look up the uh, Neural Network Engineering Handbook and, and just do as everyone else does. What is a neural network? So in a neural network, you have neurons. It's those white circles that I've shown here. And a neuron always does the same thing. It does a weighted sum of all of its inputs. So here the inputs are the pixels of the picture. I have spread all the pixels of my 20 by 20 picture into a long vector. So the neurons, they do a weighted sum of all of these pixels. Uh, they add an additional degree of freedom called a bias. And then they feed this through what is called an activation function. And that's just a function. Uh, a number comes in, number comes out. And what is specific about neural networks is that that activation function is usually non-linear. That's what makes them powerful. They can solve non-linear problems. And then you can, you can stack those layers because in the second layer, well, the neurons, instead of doing weighted sums of pixels, they do weighted sums of outputs from the previous layer. 
And then, so I stacked a couple of layers here, uh, and at the end, I end up with two neurons, because my goal is to classify my little 20 by 20 tiles into this is a plane, or this is not a plane. So I'm hoping that one of those neurons will, will, will light up and tell me plane or not plane. Let's write the TensorFlow code for this. And I will be showing you uh, quite a few code snippets. I'm not expecting you to read through the entire code, um, but I, I usually highlight in red the, the stuff that I want you to, to see. So you see there is a layers API in TensorFlow here, which represents an entire layer of neurons at once. And uh, this is a high-level API in TensorFlow, so you have to bear in mind uh, that uh, all those weights and biases which parameterize these, this layer, they will be created automatically in the background. So it's automatic, but they stay take memory, and they, st will still they will still take CPU time for the system to find what those weights and biases should be. We will do that through training. Um, so uh, as, as, a, as, a, uh, as a computer engineer, I want... To, I want you to have in mind how many weights you are creating when you are calling these, uh, uh, these high-level functions. And uh, for, um, for a dense layer, so a layer where everything is connected to everything, the number of weights is the number of inputs multiplied by the number of outputs. I put them here. So then I said, we, we have those weighted sums computed. Now I said we need an activation function. Um, you can do the research, but uh, for intermediate layers, uh, almost everyone today uses this uh, ReLU activation function, so we will use the, sa we will use the same. Uh, the only difference is on the last layer. So TensorFlow will do a lot of automatic things for you during training, and you need to provide one thing. Uh, it's called a loss, and it's an error function. So TensorFlow will be predicting here, uh, of course, uh, initially badly. You put an image in, and, in, and it, it gives you a prediction for this tile being a plane or not a plane. And what you have to provide is a distance, distance function, between what was predicted and what you know to be true. Because when you are training, you put known images so you know if this was a plane or not a plane. And um, again, this is a classification problem, so I look it up in my little handbook. It says for a classification problem, on the last layer, you use an activation function which is called softmax, and you use a distance between what was predicted and what you wanted, which is called cross entropy. Fine, I'll just call this function. Uh, in TensorFlow, there is a function that does both. So you will have noticed that this dense layer here does not have an activation function. And I call this function, which does the softmax activation and the cross-entropy distance. And of course, I have to provide the output from the layer and the correct answer. So this will compute the distance between what the network predicted and what I know to be the correct answer. From there on, we can train and TensorFlow takes over. So I can pick an optimizer uh, and ask it to optimize this loss function, and all this magic will happen automatically. So what is the magic, if you want to know the details? Um, the optimizer will compute the partial derivative of your loss relatively to all the weights and biases in the system. Uh, this, in technical terms, is known as, as a gradient, and uh, this gradient uh, will give you a direction in which to change your weights and biases to obtain a smaller loss, and that's what you want. So at each batch of input images, usually you don't do it for one image, you do it for a, a little batch of images, 100 images, for instance. You compute this gradient, and this gradient gives you little deltas to add to your weights and biases, and you move one step into somewhere where the loss is smaller, and you continue training like that. Um, this is the ReLU function. I wanted to show it to you. It's a really very simple function. It's just identity for all positive values and zero for all negative values. Uh, it's non-linear. That's the only requirement for this to be used in a neural network. Uh, on the last layer, if you want to predict continuous values, you can use those two functions as well. One is between zero and one. The other one is between minus one and one. 
And to help you understand what softmax is, I made a little animation. So softmax is a function that, uh, sorry, whoops, here, let me replay. Uh, softmax will be applied to all your output neurons. So here we have two, but I have represented 10 of them. Uh, it's actually just an exponential. So you take your weighted sum and elevate them to the exponential, but then you normalize this entire vector. You, you divide it by the norm. That gives you uh, numbers which are between normalized, so between zero and one, and you can, you can interpret them as probabilities. That's why we use softmax for classification problems, because we are looking for the probability of this, this being a plane versus the probability of this being not a plane. And the nice property of softmax is since the exponential is a very steeply increasing function, well, it will pull the winner apart, but without completely destroying the information about uh, those other neurons who, who might be getting it a little bit wrong. And that's very important for, uh, for training. All right, so we have all the ingredients. Uh, we have layers. Uh, we have radio activation on, on the intermediate layers. We have softmax activation on the last layer. Uh, the, the book tells us to, to use cross entropy as our distance function because this is a classification problem. And we've been told to do this by batches on, on our images. We have our model. We have some tools to train it. So the model is written in TensorFlow. I will be using ML Engine to, uh, to train it and also to deploy it. And I will be using TensorBoard. That's a tool for visualizing uh, during training, the loss, and, and all the rest. Uh, ML Engine is a, is a, is a, ser is a service on, uh, on Google's cloud uh, that allows you to run these training jobs. And what is nice about it is uh, that uh, you, you can launch as many jobs as you want and uh, according to the, the quota you allow to yourself, let's say you, you allow to yourself 10 GPUs and each job uses one GPU, it will either do them in parallel or will start queuing them. But you don't have to remember at the end of the day to shut it down because otherwise you would be paying or anything like that. You just send jobs and see results. Um, yeah, so no, 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 not yet. I'm ready to ship, I have everything. Let's see the results. So here I am in TensorBoard, and I train this, so I see my loss curve. Well, it's going down. So the training did something. I'm quite happy about this. And now I'm ready to detect planes in aerial imagery. Well, almost. I need a little trick to transform my classifier, 20 by 20 tiles, into a plane detector. Uh, that's a super easy trick. Here I will be sending to the detector uh, 256 by 256 tiles, so big tiles, and I simply cut them up in 20 by 20 tiles and apply the, 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 the detection to each little piece. And of course I can do this at various resolutions. Uh, if I take a big 60 by 60 tile, I resize it to 20 by 20, run it through my classifier, and I, I will know if there is a plane there. So let's see if this can see airplanes in, uh, this is San Francisco. Uh, where is this hosted uh, while it's computing? Let me tell you that. Uh, ML Engine has this second feature. Here I see my training jobs in, uh, in, uh, in the Google Cloud Console. Um, but you can also use it to deploy a model. Once the training is finished, this training is, uh, ends up as being just a file on disk where all the computed weights and biases, the optimized weights and biases, have been saved. So if I want to create a new model, uh, well, actually, if I want to create a new version of a model, I have a button here, Create Version, and I can browse to the file on disk, and that's it. When I, when I, when I hit Enter, here, Create, I will have this model deployed online Bef uh, behind uh, a REST API, which sits on a, on, a, on a fully managed serverless infrastructure that has auto-scaling. So only th the only thing I care about is, is send traffic to it. And that's what I did. Let, let me do this again, analyze. And is it seeing airplanes? So each shaded tile here is one request I do to my, to my um, deployed service. And well, it's not perfect. 
but it's seeing airplanes. I mean, it's missing this one, and it went completely berserk here. Uh, but, I mean, it was my very first try, so maybe that's not so bad. What can I do to improve it? Um, well, the first thing I need to do is tell you something about convolutional neural networks. Uh, because my little handbook tells me for a vision problem, you will not get anywhere without convolutional neural networks. So what we have seen are dense neural networks where everything is connected to everything. What is a convolutional one? The main difference is that we do our weighted sums slightly differently. We will take a little patch, a little filter of weights, and slide it through the picture. And as we slide it, we do the weighted sums, so this filter has weights, we do the weighted sums, and if we do this with a little padding on the sides and in both directions, we will obtain as many output values as we had pixels in this image. So for this we used uh, this little cube of weights, 4 by 4 by 3 Maybe that's not enough. Maybe you want to give more degrees of freedom to your system. So you do it again with a second set of weights, which produces a second you know, plane of output values. And you can do this as many times as you want. It just depends on how many weights, how many degrees of freedom you want to give to the system. So uh, convolutional layers will be these transformations between data cubes. You have a one data cube transformed into another data cube. And, and here, again, uh, as computer engineers, I want, you to, I want you to know exactly how many weights are created for each convolutional layer. So this is it. 4 by 4 is the filter size. 3 is the number of input channels. So here I have an RGB picture, color picture. That's why I have three channels, three pieces of information per pixel. And the last number is how many times you do this, uh, which also means how many uh, planes of, uh, of data you obtain as an output. So this is how we would write it in TensorFlow again. I have chained two convolutional layers here, and I transform my data cube into another data cube uh, as I go. Uh, TensorFlow has this layers that conv do 2 d function here, and you give it the number of filters, so that's the last number here. The kernel size is the first two. Uh, you don't need to give this one because that will be uh, the, the, the shape of the, your input values. And, of course, you need to specify an activation function, because when we do our weighted sums, of course, we also do the activation function. Um, if you want to squeeze the size of your data cube horizontally, uh, one simple technique is to simply use a stride. So you will make a step you know, of, instead of uh, filtering your image pixel by pixel, you do it every two pixels, and mechanically you obtain twice less values. Another popular uh, option is to use uh, just resample. So that's not a neural network, that's just a resampling operation, and one of the most popular resampling operations is called max pooling, where you take your data points four by four in little squares and just keep the maximum. So there you resample by a factor of two, your entire data cube in the horizontal dimensions. Uh, and, and one thing that I wanted to point out, that the little guy is pointing out, is that uh, something that we can call a one by one convolution, which uh, would surprise a mathematician, actually makes sense. A one by one convolution is a weighted sum of all the data points in this little column, this one by one column. But there are still many data points there, so you can do a weighted sum. Okay, a one-by-one one convolution here makes total sense. Unless you're a mathematician. We are computer engineers. So this is the network I will be building. Three convolutional layers. Uh, then at the end, since I still want to classify my, my little uh, airplanes, I want to, to get to just two neurons. The way I do that is that I take this very last data cube here, and I spread all of its values into one vector, apply a dense layer, and obtain two values at the end. So one convolutional filter, a second one, a third one, 
my reshape operation to get one big vector. Uh, actually, I have two dense layers, and the last one ends with my softmax and cross entropy operation because this is a classifier. So, this was actually the model that was running when I showed you this. It's not so bad for a first try. We have plenty of options for making it better, but this was the topic of, uh, of my, my session last year. Uh, I, I, I showed you how to use all these different regularization techniques for, for today. The only thing you have to know is that these things do not change the architecture of the network, they just help it converge. So we will use all of those techniques to help it converge. And actually, I can show you on the graphs that it helps. It really helps. Uh, this is my loss curves, so it's being optimized to be as small as possible, it's going down, that's great. But the same loss curve with all those regularization techniques is here. Much, much, much better, much lower. And there is a third thing that I want to do, uh, which is called hyperparameter tuning. So you, you realize that in this model there are plenty of parameters. The, the, the sizes of the, of, of, of the kernels, uh, the number of uh, neurons in, this, in these dense layers, uh, all of that are parameters. How do I find which are the best parameters? Well, I can use my engineering know-how, which means try to guess. And uh, if, you are, if you have done this a couple of times, you might, you might have good guesses. And that's actually a good thing, but I, also, I can also do uh, here hyperparameter tuning. So how does this work? Uh, this is a feature that is implemented in ML Engine. The way you send your model for training to, on ML Engine is that you package your Python as a Python package, which is just a folder. Uh, a folder with this config file. And usually this config file has just a scale tier standard one. I actually use scale tier basic GPU. That means which machine is this going to run on. Basic GPU means one machine with one GPU. But you can add these additional things which enable hyperparameter tuning. So here I say I want to maximize. Maximize what? My accuracy. Accuracy is a metric I have defined in my model. I didn't show you that line in TensorFlow, but that's something I do in my model. And I want to do 50 trials, so train this network 50 times. Uh, I want to do 10 trials in parallel, and here are my, hyper, my hyperparameters to optimize. How do I make those public? Well, uh, that's very simple. You uh, make them command line parameters in your package. Um, and then you say uh, that this, is an, this parameter is an integer. Please try values between 800 and 30,000 using a linear scale. There are logarithmic scales. There are categorical values if you have discrete values. And ML Engine will run all those trials for you and tell you which combination of parameters is the best. And it does this uh, quite intelligently. The way it's implemented, it's called Bayesian inference. So, well, you, you'll look it up, but it's not as simple as, as just trying them out at random. And the way it looks, maybe I have one here in my jobs. Do I have a hyperparam tuning job somewhere? Yeah, no, not this one. Oop, oop, oop. Here I have a hyperparameter tuning job. Uh, so the output is this. It says that it completed here 45 trials, and, and trial 33 is the best. And here it gives me the hyperparams that optimized it the best. So now it must be super good, right? Um, on the curves, it is actually quite better. You, you, you can't even see it on the loss, but if we go to the accuracy curve here, uh, let me remove those, boom, boom, boom. You see those accuracy curves, the, the regularized and hyperparameter tuned is here on the top, and that's 90, almost 99%. So I'm actually really, really happy with this. Let's run and see how well this classifies images. Woohoo. Uh, here, analyze. Mm. Mm. What? This is horrible. 
Well, yeah, it's seeing more planes than before. I, I don't think it's missing any. But what? <laughs> and so you see here a, a great truth in statistics, which says that there are three data sets. You have your training data set. You have your test data set on which you, you compute your accuracy. You set aside a piece of your data to, to, to test your algorithm. And then you have real life. I was 99.6% accurate on my test data set, but real life is real life. Um, I can do, and that's why your test data set sometimes is not so good. It has to represent real life, and it's always good to test in real life. Uh, actually, I managed to get this slightly, uh, to, to get a slightly better performance by augmenting my data. Uh, here you see it's, it's seeing lots of stuff that is not a plane, so it's very easy to, uh, to, to, to grab additional tiles of non-planes. You just take a huge aerial picture, eyeball it to make sure there are no planes in it, and then you can cut it up in, in 100,000 little 20 by 20 tiles and you have plenty of data. And if I do that, it's, uh, it's, it's much better, but uh, still not that great. Well, you will see there are many less false positives, but it's, uh, it's, it's still not perfect. And at this point, I'm kind of stuck with this approach. So you see here, oops, yeah. Here, it's still seeing stuff that is not a plane. Uh, what else? Well, so, what can I do? Well, before I have an idea, let me talk to you a little bit about TensorFlow. Because I told you about the model, uh, but we haven't spoken about the glue code that, does, uh, that goes around it to, uh, to actually train it. So let's go quickly through that. Uh, and we have in, in TensorFlow 1.4, which has just been published, uh, an API called Estimator, which is used to wrap your model and, and then train it and run it, uh, which is actually very nice. It's, uh, it, it has been there in previous versions of TensorFlow in Contrib, um, but it has been revamped in 1.4, and now I'm, I'm really happy with it. So in the, the way you wrap your model in an estimator is that you write this model function. That's the function which will have all the layers, 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 and you wrap it in an estimator. And your end goal is to call train and evaluate, which will run the training. And what is nice about this API is that you get a ton of stuff for free if you do that. You get checkpoints. When something crashes, you relaunch, and it restarts from the latest checkpoint. Automatically, you get uh, uh, your model saved to disk at, at regular intervals so that you can deploy it and, uh, and, and, and use it. Uh, it even handles uh, cluster training automatically. If you want to send this to, uh, to multiple machines, all you have to do is change this ML engine spec and instead of one machine specifying multiple machines, and so on. So what else do you have to do? Uh, there are these things, but I want you to look at the parameters, what you need to implement. And you see those are three data input functions. So you need to write one function which will load data during training, one function which will load data during testing, and one function which will load data when you deploy the model and you want to use it. It's behind the REST API, so you will be sending JSON to it. What does it do when it receives the JSON? So let's see that. Uh, let, let's see first the model function. That's just, just layers, 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 layers. And the API asks you to uh, output a dictionary called predictions, which is something you define, whatever your model predicts. It's free form. It will need the loss. It needs this training operation, which is what, what you obtain when you ask an optimizer to minimize your loss. And then you can return a set of metrics. Uh, which is, uh, again, you decide what that is, and those will appear automatically in TensorBoard. You will be able to track them there. Uh, what else? Yeah, one thing you might have been surprised is that uh, when you call this optimizer, it returns a training operation. What is that? Well, actually, one thing you have to know is that TensorFlow has a deferred execution model. Everything you write in TensorFlow doesn't execute immediately. It builds a, a graph in memory. And uh, 
It's only when you will start feeding data and executing this graph that you will obtain actual values out of it. So this train operation is one of the operations in this computation graph, and that operation, when executed, that is the operation that will compute the gradient and compute the little deltas to add to your weights and biases, and that is the operation that will actually change the weights and biases of your neural network during training. Um, the function for, for, for getting data when you have a deployed model. Here again, you might be surprised because I thought initially, okay, how complicated can this be? You get a piece of JSON, you do some treatment, and you return a value. But here, it doesn't accept any parameters. Mm. How does that work? Again, think graph. This function is executed only once when the model is instantiated. And when it is, it is, it is executed, its goal is to produce a little piece of graph that will go from the JSON to whatever your model needs as an output. And that piece of graph will then be grafted on top of your model. So the way it works is that here, first, you have to define uh, the shape of your JSON. You, you do that by defining a Python dictionary uh, with placeholders for whatever data will be. And then you can do any transformations you want. And what you return is this shape dictionary and whatever uh, you, you need as an input for your model. So the, here I, I gave you the, the pass-through function when I don't, don't do anything, but this is actually how I implemented my transformation from a plain classifier into a plain um, uh, detector. Uh, and you see in this function when I receive a 20, uh, 256 by 256 tile, I have one call here that decodes the JPEG, and I have a second call here that does crop and resize, and in TensorFlow, crop, crop and resize take a, takes a picture, but it doesn't take just one crop box. You can, you can give it a collection of crop boxes. So that's what I did. I generated all the possible crop boxes for my big tile, all the 20 by 20 tiles I, I can cut out from it at various resolutions, and I just give it the whole collection, and it gives me a whole collection of 20 by 20 tiles as an output. It's a bit brutal. I obtain roughly 5,000 small tiles, so it's not going to be super efficient, but that's what I, how I did it here. And finally, how do I load data? So for that, we have a new data set API, which is, is new, and I really love it because my, what you write here is exactly what I wanted to write when loading data. So uh, here, data, there is some load operation, but then I need to shuffle my data to make the training efficient. So I, I, I write shuffle uh, with some buffer to adjust how many things I, I, I load into memory before starting shuffling. I do mini batching, so here I batch it by batches of 100. And of course, when I train, I need, need my data to be repeated multiple times, so I just say repeat, and that will repeat indefinitely. So again, don't, you don't need to read through the, the, the whole code. Um, the rest of the code here implements uh, one very, very, very standard solution to a very standard problem, which is that usually your data doesn't fit in memory. So here with the dataset API in a couple of lines, I've been able to, uh, to, to write something that will load my data from files gradually as it needs it. And I can train on a data set that is much bigger than what my memory can, con can contain. And what I like about it is that the instructions for actually managing my, my, uh, my training data, they look very natural with this data set. All right, now let's actually build a detector. And uh, our little handbook of best practices is, um, is uh, basically out of good things to say. Now we have to go and read papers. So there are many papers that describe how you can build vision networks. Uh, they, they are on the right there. And many other papers that describe how you do detection. So how you do the specific task in vision where you generate a bounding box again around something. And since it is a lot of work to read all of them, I read them for you and these are my two favorite ones, uh, the ones that I find most elegant. So I will be using these two, SqueezeNet for my stack of convolutional layers, that's my architecture, and YOLO for the way to turn that into a detector. 
So first of all, let's have a look at these other papers. There are a couple of interesting ideas there. Oh, data. Yeah, my 20 by 20 tiles are not good enough. Now I need real images. And I couldn't find the data set, but <laughs> I was kind of lucky. Uh, I made myself a little JSUI and I started clicking on planes and it, well, I clicked on 2,000 planes by hand, but it's not so bad, 2,000 is okay. What I'm lucky here is that now I will be, to, to, to generate my training data set, I will simply be stamping out 256 by 256 tiles at random from those big aerial pictures and I know where the boxes are so I will be able to recompute that and I have a potentially very big data set by doing that. So sometimes you're lucky and you can generate your data set rel with relatively little initial information. So inception paper. This one was published by Google. Its initial goal was to spot a cat or, or recognize that this is a cat versus a dog and so on. And the first thing you see is that it's, it's very bizarre. All of those are convolutional layers, but I told you that you can chain them up, you know, one layer after another, and this does branches. It's kind of weird. So the idea here is actually very simple. Uh, the researchers said, well, what is best? Is it a one-by-one one convolution followed by a three-by-three three, three three convolution? Or is it better to do a max pooling operation and then a one-by-one? One? Hmm. We don't know. Why don't we let the network decide? So they implemented all of them in parallel. They take the little data cube that all of those generate as an output, and they just stack them up together, concatenate them, and that's the new output. That's an interesting idea. Second interesting idea here is that you see most of those convolutions are very cheap. It's either one by one convolutions or three by three convolutions. What happened to bigger filters? Why, why aren't we using bigger filters? Well, let's look at two 3x3 three three convolutions in sequence. Uh, let's start from the bottom here. This one little piece of data is a weighted sum of this 3x3 three three patch. And if you look at uh, where does the, do these white data points come, they come from a 5x5 five five patch right above it. So you see a sequence of two 3x3 three three convolutions is some weighted sum of a 5x5 five five patch. The same as a 5x5 five five convolution. It's not mathematically exactly the same because we don't forget after our weighted sum, we always have a, a nonlinearity, a ReLU or something. So it's not exactly the same, but it's worth benchmarking one against the other. And uh, uh, it's, it's worth doing that because Two 3x3 three three convolutions, that's just 18 weights. A 5x5 five five convolution is 25 weights. So much cheaper to do three, two 3x3 three three convolutions. And since we have those two non-linearities, maybe it's even better. So that's an interesting idea. And then those 1x1 one one convolutions, for which we have seen they do make sense, their other advantage is that they're super cheap. Look, this is just 1 by 1 by 10 by 5, which is 50 weights. 50 weights, I have a whole convolutional layer. That's really super cheap. So we will be using those a lot as well. Um, they also introduce something called global average pooling. So usually when you want to end, at the end of your network, you want to end and classify something. You take your last data cube and you reshape it into a vector. You have a dense layer, apply softmax, use cross entropy loss, you have a classifier. Well, they said that's a lot of weights. Um, actually, why instead we don't do something in our convolutional layers so that the last cube has exactly the number is exactly as deep as, as we have uh, as our number of classes. And then we simply slice it up like a piece of bread and average out all the values in each plane, and that gives, you, gives us five values. Here we do softmax, and we have five categories, and that costs us zero weights. Super cheap. Suspiciously cheap, this one, if you ask me. So we'll try to use all of those ideas. Uh, but uh, since I don't want to write all of these things, that's a bit too heavy, uh, I like this other paper called SqueezeNet, which applies these modern ideas, but in a, in a slightly, you know, uh, simpler package. I find it a lot more elegant. So their 
they are based on modules. They still have this idea of doing two things at once and letting the network decide which one is the best. But uh, the module is much simpler. It's just one one-by-one one convolution, which they call a squeeze operation, because most of the time it's used to reduce the, the, the depth of the data cube. Thank you. <laughs> and then they do this, uh, these two parallel operations, either a one-by-one one or a three-by-three three convolution. They call these modules fire modules. And uh, what I like about this architecture is, is that when you, when you build a full stack, it's very simple. You have fire modules, you have a max pooling operation to reduce your, 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 the size of your data cube horizontally, then fire, fire modules, and so on. So let's use this. But I also want to compare it against something other. Uh, I told you that I will be using this uh, YOLO paper. YOLO, that means you look only once. Uh, that's a detection paper. And uh, in there, they are rolling out their own convolutional stack, which they call the darknet. So I will benchmark darknet uh, against squeeze-net to see what's best. On the darknet size, you see it's a much more traditional architecture, just layers, 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 layers. And we try to bring the, our, the size of our data cube down horizontally as we condense the information. At the end, we, we want just a little bit of information. And you see the, the depth of the data cube. Here I had it vary between 64 and 32, so not too deep. On the other side, SqueezeNet, you recognize those modules, a one by one convolution followed by in parallel a three by three and a one by one. You can see it on the data cube here. Uh, the one by one does this squeeze operation. You see a thin data cube as a result. And then this uh, pair uh, concatenates its output. So, so it's an expand operation and you see a fat data cube again. And again, this time I'm using max pooling layers to try to bring the size down horizontally as well. Uh, and just to benchmark them, I wanted to give them a simple goal, uh, which is to count planes. So I appended at the end using global pooling, I appended a, a softmax layer, which categorizes those tiles into tiles with zero, one, two, or many planes. What does that mean? Where does that... What kind of results do I have there? So, initially, let's click here. Oh, is this converging at all? I'm not quite sure, but if you look at the images, so here is the number of planes, the actual number of planes, and here is what was computed. And it's, 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 it's doing something. Actually, it's correct here. No planes, no planes. There are three here, no planes, no planes. I have one other plane, it got it right here. So it's seeing something. It's, it's maybe not super good, but it's seeing something. Uh, but this looked like a, too much a, of a hard problem for, uh, for my, uh, this, this classification problem. So I, t I started classifying only into zero plane and one plane and started comparing here dark net and squeeze net about the same. And then I thought, hmm, I, I, I'm, I'm wondering about this global average pooling operation here. I'm trying to spot planes, to count them. I need to know where they are. And a convolutional network is actually very good at spotting them where they are. I'm scanning with filters. The filter says, oh, here I'm seems, I've seen something interesting. And when I do global average pooling, I kind of globally average this information across the whole image. That sounded like something bizarre to do if you are interested in local information. So I tried to revert to my previous uh, reshape plus dense layer operation. And lo and behold, whoa, much better loss. So uh, the learning here was uh, if you're interested in local information, don't do global average pooling. Uh, and the other learning is that my squeeze net and dark net perform roughly the same. Uh, the one is a lot more expensive than the other. Uh, here I put the number of weights, 320,000 for one, 60,000 for the other. So I will be using the squeeze net and I'm ready to build my detector. So how does this work in uh, the YOLO paper? It's actually very simple and elegant. You take your image you divide it in a grid of cells, 
And in each grid, you say each grid cell is now allowed to generate a certain number of bounding boxes, let's say two bounding boxes. So for each grid cell, you manipulate your network so that it, it, it produces uh, four additional numbers, X and Y, that's the position of the bounding box, W is its size, and C is some confidence, which is one if there is a plane, and which tends to be zero when there is no plane. And the trick is that even though those bounding boxes are constrained within a grid cell, okay, their center must stay in the grid cell, the width can be as big as the full image. So they can grow past this grid cell. And you see here I have a big plane, so I need one of those bounding boxes to grow. What loss will I be using? Well, they, lose, they use this loss. Uh, I hacked it up a little because it was too complicated. Boom, boom, boom. Let's remove all that. No, I, I, they had a, some tricks which, which sounded weird, and I tested. And for my use case, I didn't need the tricks. So you end up with... Uh, uh, a first line up there, which is the distance between where the bounding boxes are detected and where the real bounding boxes are. Uh, a second line that is the, the error on the size of the boxes. A third line that is the error on the, uh, the, the confidence factor. The only little bizarre thing were these ones, and that, those are the assignments. When you are computing this distance between what was predicted and what you know to be true, you need to assign a generated bounding box to one of those ground truth bounding boxes. And yes, you have the grid, and you assign by grid cell, but if each grid cell generates, is allowed to generate multiple bounding boxes and there is only one plane, there is my, you have to make some decisions. So I didn't know, initially flipped a coin, implemented what was easiest. Um, but that gives us something already. So how do I do my last layer? I take my last cube, I cut it up in my grid, and now each column I divide it in four. Why four? Because a bounding box is X, Y, W, and C. That's four numbers. Uh, if I am generating multiple bounding boxes per grid cell, I would divide it in 12, uh, in eight or 12, and so on. And from here, I average out those values and use these activation functions hyperbolic tangent because x and y are between minus 1 and 1. Those are relative to the grid cell center. And w and c are between 0 and 1. And let's see the results. So, uh, I tried first a 4 by 4 by 1 YOLO grid. And oof, again, is this converging at all? So I'm showing you one of those, uh, one components of those uh, losses, the one where, where the variations are the most visible. Uh, but then I went to the images and, and look, the gray boxes, that's ground truth, but the yellow boxes is what the, the network sees. And it, it looks like it's starting to see something. So I was on a good track. Then I tried uh, to have more of these uh, bounding boxes generated, uh, grid of four by four by allow, but allow four boxes uh, per uh, grid cell. And it's much better. But then I thought, but now I have this, this box assignment problem. I'm generating four bounding boxes per grid cell, and if there is only one plane, it's a bit weird, because um, if I assign just one of them, then one of those boxes is, is now trained to see the plane, and the three others are trained not to see it, but it's the same pixels. So how does the network make sense of that? I, I didn't know. So I, I tried uh, an 8 by 8 grid with just one bounding box per grid cell to avoid this problem, and yeah, works better. The loss is, again, much lower. So I went to 16 by 16 by 1, and that is even better. And if you want to, to see how this performs here on my little demo, I have 8 by 8 by 1. Let's run this. And it's, 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 well, this is too good. Uh, this was supposed, supposed to be a little bit not as good as, uh, as, good as that, but uh, I, I, without cherry picking, I just found the example where it was too good. So let's try 16 by 16 by 16. Well, you see, it was a, a bit of luck, uh, because here I have a, a false detection. I have a, a couple of planes that were missed. And so the last thing I did 
uh, was uh, work a little bit on those grid assignments. And uh, I did more grid arithmetic to make sure that when I had two boxes allowed and one plane, they would both be trained to see the plane. And it, there are a couple of edge cases, but whatever. I haven't actually finished optimizing that. But with that, I have... Uh, well, and, and yes, I, I first looked at the paper, and I was hoping that the paper would solve it. And the paper said, uh, in limitations, they said, our model is not very good at swarm-type things. So, well, thank you. <laughs> I'm using your model specifically on a swarm-type problem. But it was just this box, box assignment issue. So, with this last one, uh, it actually works quite well. And what I'm quite happy is that it sees the little plane here as well. So, that's what I wanted to share with you today. Uh, since it's the last session of the day, we, we might extend a little bit uh, to, to talk about something interesting called GANs. But first, uh, the conclusion is that I think, that's my conviction, that as a software developer, uh, it is possible to jump into, into machine learning. Uh, it's, let's say, as hard or as easy as, as learning a new language. Uh, you, you learn new concepts, you learn new things that you can piece together. Um, but uh, you see here on, on this example, once you know which Lego bricks work, and usually it's quite easy. If it has a function in TensorFlow, it's a Lego brick that usually works. Uh, once you know that, and once you learn how to assemble them, uh, I think you can all, we can all get there. So thank you. And for those who care to stay for five additional minutes, I have something funny to show you. Piecing, and those who want to go, please go. Uh, piecing those Lego pieces together in a specific way, someone built this. So you recognize here a convolutional neural network that uh, classifies images. What does it classify? It classifies real images versus fake images produced by this funny thing here. So that's a classifier. We know how that works. Uh, we end up on, on a softmax layer with two neurons. It says fake, real. This generator, I will, you will look it up for yourself how you can do convolutional layers which upscale images. It's not exactly the same convolutional layers that we have seen here, but it's, it's possible. And they, are, they also have weights and, and biases and so on, and you can train them. So you start with a little vector here, which is random. It's just noise. And you run it through this upscaling convolutional network, and you generate an image. And then what you're trying to do is to fool the discriminator, to generate images that he will uh, think are real. So to train the discriminator, uh, it's normal. You put a known image, or sorry, you put a real image, or you put a, a fake image. And uh, depending on what he says, you do the retropropagation, you train it. Now, once you generate an image with the generator, you run it through the discriminator, the training is a little bit different for the generator. Whatever the output you say, the, the results I wanted is real. I want to fool you. I want real. And you retropropagate that. Well, actually, you just compute the gradient. You, you don't touch the weights of the discriminator. You apply them only here in the generator. And what is going to happen is that the discriminator we learn how, what are, like here I have anime characters. We learn what are good features of anime characters. That anime characters have colorful hair, large eyes. And in return, the generator, since it is optimized through the discriminator, we learn that to fool it, it needs to produce large eyes, it needs to produce colorful, ha colorful hair, and so on. And in the end, you get uh, generated anime characters. That's kind of fun, but that's not why I'm sharing this with you. Then people do, did this. They said, well, it's learning the concept of, of large eyes. Maybe. Let's try to test this. So they took three generated images of people with glasses, added those. Each of those images is generated by one random vector somewhere in this Latin space here. This random vector, one vector gives one of those images. They averaged them. Then they took three men without glasses, they averaged them. Subtracted those two and, say, and said, now, this difference is the concept of glasses. 
How can we test this? Well, they took three women, averaged them, added glasses on that woman, and it started generating a woman with glasses. So this is completely unsupervised. We just threw a bunch of faces at this network, totally unsupervised. And the network has been able to uh, generate the concept of sunglasses totally by itself. So it's the first step in unsupervised learning. I, found this, I find this really exciting. Another, I don't know, also exciting thing that you can do is that you can do this with a smile. You can actually do this with any facial expression. So I think in a not so distant future, uh, we will have a fake news video uh, that will look completely realistic and where, um, I don't know, uh, uh, Donald Trump will, uh, will read a love letter to Hillary Clinton. Uh, and if you think that, well, you will not be fooled by these little low-resolution images with lots of artifacts, this just came out of NVIDIA last week. And these are generated images. All of it is generated. Uh, you see interpolations because in this Latin space, once you have one face and another face, they are just vectors, so you can interpolate between the two. But they are all generated. This is not morphing between real faces. It's all generated. And this time, it's in high resolution, and, and I find it beautiful. Thank you. <laughs>